So again, it's kind of a trick question because it depends on, you know, which way are we applying a force to the material, right? On which axis? And uh, let's see, Selena says plywood because the wood fibers go in different ways. Yeah, so that's correct. The pine plywood, if we were just to try to karate chop, chop it, the pine plywood would be superior, okay? And that's because we have uh, the different directions of the grains going cross laminate and we're making a composite that's going to be stronger in all different directions rather than the solid pine board where it's unidirectional. All right. And this is why, you know, if, if, if you're familiar with baseball, with baseball bats, right, baseball bats, uh, professional baseball bats are made out of wood, all right, a solid piece of wood. And the, the wood has a certain direction of the grain. And usually on these bats, there's like maybe a little dot that indicates which way you're supposed to be swinging the bat. Because if you swing it the wrong way and the ball hits uh, along a certain uh, direction of the grain, it can, it's more prone to breaking. All right. So that's what we call anisotropic material. Where the pine plywood is taking care of this problem, it's making more isotropic. We're changing the direction of the grain, making layers. So it's like a composite. Yeah, so like I said, it's, it's a bit of a, a trick question, but okay. And so let's move on. Uh, and then I have a lot of slides, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this, right? So we take elemental properties, the properties of the elements, their atomic arrangement, we can change that. Then through processing, we can change their microstructure. Different microstructures can also give us different unique properties. Here's an image of uh, titanium oxide nanotubes. Um, and then, so these will give us the material properties that we can use through our designing and manufacturing for certain applications devices. So we have an example of a, a computer chip here and inside the computer, computer chip, there are billions of semiconductor transistors, silicon, doped silicon transistors, billions of them inside. And that's what makes our computers do our, their calculations. We have uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, orthopedics for impl implants, like uh, titanium metal implants. And so there's certain properties you have to consider, like the, the biocompatibility of the material. You don't want to put a material in that's going to make us sick, that's going to leach into our body or maybe corrode due to our body and leach into us. Um, and you also want a material that has a, a compatible uh, Young's modulus. If you have a, a strong uh, gradient of Young's modulus between your bone and the, the, the implant, that's gonna to lead to uh, uh, problems as well. And then also uh, like, for example, steel, structural engineering. Um, Dr. Brush on Monday's class mentioned the historical ages, right? Stone age, iron age, or bronze age, iron age. Um, and I think another one that's very important is the steel age, right? So when we're, we take iron and we add carbon to, to make it stronger, uh, it allows us to do things that we haven't done before like build skyscrapers. There's a, there's a great example also during, I, I believe maybe the 1700s or so, um, there was a, a, I think it was Beethoven, but it, it might be Bach. I forget the details of the, the story, but one of these composers makes the song for piano or harpsichord or some instrument, some stringed instrument. And it, the song is so intense that it can never be completely played through because the, 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 the piano wires keep breaking, okay? And it's not until a certain uh, uh, advancement in the technology of making these steel wires that allows you to, that, that finally this song could be played completely without the steel piano wires breaking. So it's kind of an interesting an antidote. What is the bottom, uh, tetrahedron, uh, probably, yeah, let's see. Performance, properties, processing, and structure. So microstructure is here what I say, right? Structure can play an important role, right? Like in this example here, I have titanium oxide and they're, they're made as nanotubes, all right? You could also have titanium oxide made as, as spherical particles and they're going to, for this application was for, uh, I believe, uh, 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 electrolysis of water. So using light UV energy to, to break water down. And so the advantage of having nanotubes is they have a high surface area allowing the, the more water to break down. Oh, I skipped ahead. So here's another example of, of taking a single element. All right, in this case, it's carbon. And there's two different types of carbon. And uh, you guys can help me. Uh, I kind of gave it away. 
uh, what are the two different types of carbon this single element can, can exist as? Okay, thank you, Gregory. So graphite and diamond, and that's given by their crystal structures. And Dr. Brush had mentioned this, and we'll, we'll go over it more in detail next week in his lectures. The crystal structure, a crystal is uh, the repeating symmetry of how the atoms are arranged, all right? So carbon can be arranged in two different crystal structures. One is in these planar units where you have these sheets of carbon and then uh, they're hexagonally coordinated in a plane. And then you also have it uh, coordinated in tetrahedrons like this. And so these make two distinct different uh, materials. And yeah, Sophia and Gregory mentioned it, graphite and diamond. So one is graphite and one is diamond. And just by changing the arrangement, just by changing the atomic arrangement of the same atom, you drastically change the properties of the material, right? Graphite, obviously we have optical properties. Graphite is opaque, it's black, it's shiny, it may be slightly reflective. Diamond, on the other hand, is transparent, okay? And so what are, um, the next question, what are some different applications of these different materials of carbon, of these different forms of carbon? So let's start with graphite. Who can tell me uh, uh, one or two uh, different applications of graphite? Good, pencils is one. Can we get another one? Cooling, and cooling because maybe it has high thermal conductivity. Lubricant, perfect. Okay, you guys are you're spot on, yeah. So my examples are pencil lead and lithium ion battery anode, all right? Uh, let's start with the pencil lead. And uh, someone mentioned lubricant, and that's exactly why we use it as a pencil lead, okay? So, so I, I believe the lead itself is a composite of graphite and some other clay-like material that can change the hardness of the pencil. But graphite, because it's made out of these layers of carbon, these sheets called graphene, the sheets are not very well bonded together. I believe it's uh, the uh, van der Waals bonds that keep them together. So the bonding is very weak between the sheets. That allows the sheets to be, to be peeled off very easily. And that's why it's used as a lubricant. In fact, in many mechanical processes, graphite is added as a lubricant to reduce wear between you know, rubbing surfaces. And for the same reason, in pencil lead, when you put it across a piece of paper, the graphene sheets are flaking off and they remain on the paper. For lithium ion batteries, for the anode, um, first off, it's a, it's a common misconception that lithium ion batteries like your phone battery or your, self, uh, your, uh, your computer battery, your laptop battery, that it's a misconception that they contain lithium metal. None of these batteries, none of the commercial batteries for like your car or, or whatever, uh, electronic devices contain lithium metal. That is a misconception. It'd be way too dangerous to have a rechargeable battery, uh, there's too much liability to have uh, lithium metal. Now, primary batteries, those that do not recharge, you can buy those at the, the, like the store. Primary batteries do contain lithium metal, but those are not for recharging. But in place of lithium metal, the anode is graphite. And they use graphite because graphite has this nice interplanar spacing that lithium can get into, or ions, different ions can get into in between. Yeah, lithium ions are the ones that occasionally explode. And, and that can be because of uh, quick cycling or charging. Uh, there could be different defects, but over time, the batteries will wear down. Sometimes lithium metal does form deposits on the surface of the graphite. And if the, over many, many cycles, that lithium metal can grow, and these are called dendrites. And if they reach the other side of the battery, then it short circuits, and that creates a lot of heat. But uh, commercial lithium ion batteries for electronic applications uh, do not contain lithium metal. So how about diamond? What are a couple, what are a couple uh, uh, applications of diamond, a different form of carbon? Good, saw edges, tools. And why, why would we use, uh, uh, why would we use it for tools like saws, you know, hardness? because diamond is the hardest material 
we know of. So we use it for things that need to cut things, right? So here we have, someone also mentioned jewelry, all right, so, but, but diamond coated saw blades, right? Or different cutting tools. It's very hard, so it's gonna cut other materials, right? If diamond is the hardest material, how do we polish diamond into these different shapes? Okay, Justin says with diamond, uh, it looks like uh, Liam said lasers. I'm not too sure, per perhaps with lasers as well, but yeah. So diamonds are polished with other diamonds, the very, very small like diamond grit. You know, we can still crush diamond. Diamond is a ceramic material. It doesn't have a very high toughness, right? If you apply a lot of force to it, you can still break it, but it's still very hard. Hardness and toughness, not necessarily the same thing, okay? Um, and also we use diamond as jewelry because it's, it has nice optical properties. It has a very high index of refraction, so the light can bend a lot when it, it reflects inside. Also, large, you know, diamond itself is not too scarce of material, but, you know, large diamonds are, are, are more rare. But mostly the cost is controlled by the industry. Anyways, how do they, uh, lab-grown, okay. So I'm not sure about jewelry for lab-grown diamonds, but I do know that you, there are lab-grown diamonds and I'm not sure how, what impact it has on the economy, but uh, to make a lab-grown diamond, they have these, these machines and basically it, 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 they're big metal components and they, you need to apply a large amount of pressure, right? Diamond only forms at a high pressure and temperature. And so to, to create such a high pressure, I believe what they do is they, they take these metal uh, uh, you know, blocks and they heat them up. And when a material gets heat, heated up, when it increases its temperature, it expands. So if you have two metal blocks and then inside is your carbon and you heat them both up, they're going to expand against each other. And that creates an enormous amount of pressure, enough to, uh, you know, make diamond, which diamond, remember, you probably know this, diamond at room temperature and atmospheric pressure is not stable, right? The most stable phase of uh, carbon is graphite. So the, to make diamond, you have to reach that, that equilibrium environment, which is high pressure and high temperature. All right, you guys, are, there's too much chat. I can't keep up. So if you have something important to say, you're going to have to say it out loud. Let's move on. So uh, today we talked about electron configuration, and we have a couple of problems dealing with that. Right, and so Dr. Brush probably showed this, uh, he, he showed this slide, I know. But um, so if we look at the, the periodic table of elements, right, it, and I know Dr. Brush had mentioned this, that the, uh, the uh, orbitals of these materials will fill based on the, you know, the order of the periodic table, right? So we start with the S orbitals and we work our way to the second principal number, 2S, and then that has suborbitals, P, and so on. Okay, so the way these orbitals fill up is, goes by what's called the Pauli exclusion principle, and that's for each suborbital, you can only, only two electrons are allowed to occupy that shell, or the suborbital, okay? So for uh, S, we have only one suborbital. Orbital. For P, we have three. For D, we have five. For F, we have seven, and so on. And the way we uh, we add the electrons to these orbitals goes by what's called the off-bow rule. All right. Okay, we start at, we always fill it in at the lowest energy, right? The electrons always want to take the lowest energy available, right? If we're, if we're talking about, uh, for example, like potential energy, we want the lowest negative uh, potential energy. Okay, so that's the order that they fill these shells. Is they always go to the lowest energy. Now, uh, what's important about the off-bow rule is that it doesn't necessarily go, you know, SPD. Once you get to 3P, you're going to go fill, start filling the 4S rather than the 3D. Even though 3D has a lower principal number than the 4S, uh, and that's because the 4S, when you occupy the 4S, it has a lower energy than the 3D that's partially occupied. But we'll see this, this sort of breaks down a little bit later when we talk about ionization. Um, and then also, we, uh, Dr. Brush mentioned the Bohr model, right? And so this is a kind of a way we can uh, illustrate how to fill these different shells. However, um, you really have to forget about the Bohr model, 
because that's not a good representation of what these, these orbitals, these electron orbitals look like, right? So these electron orbitals or electron clouds look more like these shapes, okay? And so this is an example of the probability of finding an electron in these electron orbitals for like 1s, 2s, and 3s. So s is very easy because it's, it's uh, spherical and it's very easy to calculate because it's symmetric. But when you get to p and d and f, then they, they, they get more complex. And the way to calculate these probabilities of finding the electron in these different shells is like Dr. Brush had mentioned through the, the, through the wave function. And the easiest to calculate is hydrogen wave function because it, it only has one electron. Um, you do not need to, to know any of this, but you should know that the electron orbitals do take up different shapes, at least to the, you know, the, the P shapes. Uh, those are, you should, should know. And then I think further on, if you get into more advanced uh, classes, you should, you should know about the Ds as well. I deal, a lot of electrochemistry deals with the D orbitals and the D orbitals for transition metals can help determine the shape of these crystals and the shape of these molecules that we use in our materials. Okay. And then the quantum numbers, it, it's kind of like a, a barcode or a, a serial number for each electron that exists in an atom. It has a specific quantum number associated with it. And this is something you should know if, if and we'll have an example problem, that you should be able to identify the quantum number for a given electron, okay? So uh, and it starts off very easily, easy with principal number, right? That's just the, the different, uh, the principal level, all right? One, two, and three, and so on, okay? And this is an example for sodium. So the sodium uh, was an example before, right? And this is the electron configuration of sodium. Uh, if we look on the periodic table, okay, well, this one doesn't give it, but sodium would be, so we have hydrogen, lithium, sodium is this one right here. So if we were to fill it up, we would say hydrogen has 1s, and then helium has 2s, and then so on, or excuse me, uh, 1s2, and then 2s2, 2p6, and then sodium is right here. The valence electron of sodium would be 3s1, right? So this is how you would write that out. And so the question is, if we want to take this one electron here, the valence electron, what is the quantum number that is used to identify that one valence electron? Okay, so this is the example I have. So it's 3s1, remember, so the principal number is 3. Orbital angular momentum, that relates with, you know, the, the, whether it's s or p. So in this case, it's 0. s is always 0. Okay, p would be 1, for example. So it's uh, 0. Magnetic, uh, the quantum number, okay, that also refers to the symmetry of these suborbitals. For s, the it doesn't have any unique symmetry like p does it's always going to be zero and then spin is uh, arbitrary up or down or a positive one half or negative one half so you can assign it positive one half for this this example but there will be another problem uh, after this so here's our, our first uh, problem and i want you guys to take uh, a, a good 30 seconds it shouldn't take too long we'll go over it together but i want to give you some time to do it yourself and then we can come together as a class uh, to, to solve it. Uh, so this is just looking at the electron configuration for oxygen and iron. And I want you to find oxygen anion O2 minus and ox also iron uh, 2 plus, so the ferrous ion. But uh, my recommendation is if you're, if you're not too familiar with this, and we'll do this together, start with the neutral atom. Okay, don't worry about the ion yet. Just find the electron configuration of the neutral atom and then we can worry about the ionization later. So I'll give you a, a good minute or so, try to write this down and we can, we can talk about it together. Okay, how does the quiz work? Is it just lecture or actual Canvas quiz? Um, so right now, I, I ha we haven't done this before. So in my mind, it's going to be a Canvas quiz that we will uh, locate time during lecture for, or during quiz section for. And it, it will only be available during that time. Maybe some, so there might be some grace period before and after, but 
Um, we'll, I think that's going to be how it is. We'll try it out, see how it works. Okay, so let's go over this problem. Let's start with oxygen and let's start with uh, oxygen, the neutral atom of oxygen, so not the ion. Um, and if, we'll go through this, but if, if something does not make sense to you, please shout out and we can, we can go over it again a little bit more slowly. But um, who, who can give me the electron configuration of oxygen, the neutral atom of oxygen? 1s2, 2s2, 2p4? Yes, that's correct. So I'll put it up here. So here's the neutral um, atom of oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Uh, here it is written out. So, you know, if this was on a test or homework, I, I think this, was, this is going to be the expected answer, right? Just to write this, this long list of letters and numbers. But I also uh, drew out the, you know, the, the filling of these orbitals. And the filling of these orbitals, you know, we use these uh, up half arrows and down half arrows to represent each electron that gets filled. And remember, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, each suborbital can only have two electrons occupied at once. Now, when you get to a spot such as the p orbitals here, where we start occupying them, um, do the off bow principle, we're going to try to minimize the energy of these electrons. So the best way to fill it up is to first fill up one in each, and then we'll pair them up because it takes additional energy to pair up uh, two electrons together. The, the analogy I like to use is, you know, if you're getting on a, a bus, you know, you always, when people get on the bus, they always try to go for an empty seat. And then when the bus gets filled, then you start doubling up, right? That's the analogy. Um, so how about, oh, and the, the up arrow represents up spin and down arrows down spin, or positive one half and negative one half for the quantum number. How about now let's look at the anion, all right? Anion means we're giving the molecule or the, we're giving the atom more electrons, all right? Oxygen, if we look at the periodic table, oxygen, would like to receive two electrons. They always want to fill up this, uh, what we call the noble gases, right? If that makes it a complete uh, octet or completely filled orbitals, if it receives those two electrons. So what would the, the configuration be for oxygen two minus? That's right, two P six. So we're adding two electrons. They're just going to fill in those, those vacant, half spots of the, the P groups, right? So that's oxygen and ion. Uh, how about iron? Let's start with just the neutral atom for iron. Who can, who can give me a, uh, a electron configuration? All right, so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Yeah, that's correct. Now, uh, according, remember, according to the off-bow rule, right, we would fill the 4s first and then fill the 3d, just like you wrote out. You have the 3d6 after 4s2. However, um, in, the, in, the, in Callister, your textbook, and also, I think this is the correct way to do it. I would put the four, the higher principal numbers, 
after, even though they're the ones that you don't necessarily fill up uh, first. And the reason is, and you'll see the, the reason, is because you wanna ask yourself, which, which electrons have the highest energy? Is it the 3D electrons or is it the 4S electrons? Okay, now it, we'll see that when we, when we ionize this ion. So let's go to the iron two plus. What is the configuration for iron two plus? And I, I guess I gave away a really big hint, so it's gonna be obvious, but who can, and you can just give me, give me the three Ds and four Ss. What, what, what does that look like? If you don't wanna write out the whole thing. Three D four, four S two. Okay, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up. So that is not gonna be the correct answer. The correct answer would be to remove the 4s electrons before touching the 3d electrons. And I actually, now, I, now you've made me a little bit nervous because I want to make sure, I'm pretty sure that's correct. But if you guys find otherwise, you should shout it out. I'm pretty sure this is correct. Um, because it's the, the lowest energy state. If we were to, you know, say we did, did it your way and say we left uh, two electrons in here um, and then we take two away from the D instead of the 4S. Then we don't have a, it's, it's lower energy to have this partial, uh, half filled and partially filled D orbitals than to have, uh, you know, the 4S with uh, unfilled, un half filled 3D. That's just the, the, the way it is for energy wise. It's always trying to f have the lowest energy state. And in this case, it'd be to take away the 4S first. So this is, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, so, you know, if we look at, let's not go to the transition metals yet. Let's just look at potassium and calcium, for example. All right, so if we get to argon, argon has a full, uh, was a 3P, 3P6. And now we get to potassium, what are we gonna fill first? Again, it, is it gonna be a lower energy to partially fill the 4S or is it lower energy to partially fill the 3D? And in this case for potassium, it'd be lower energy to first fill, half fill the 4S. And then you see that it's more evident in calcium. If you have a completely filled orbital, that's usually more stable, less, fill, uh, less energy than if you have a unfilled uh, like D orbital. Yeah, half filled would be more stable um, oh, okay. That, yeah, Zhu Yu, you do bring up a good point. So if it would be 3D, 4S1 would be two half filled. Um, so in this case, I think you should double check me on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm correct, but uh, I could be wrong. Pretty sure I'm corrected to remove the 4S, but you know. Anyways, so that's the ferrous ion, uh, ferrous iron, which is iron two plus. Um, and also you can replace a lot of this with the noble metal or excuse me, not the noble, uh, the noble gas uh, configuration, because the noble gas configuration is going to represent, if you just put this in brackets, it's going to represent all the way up to 3P6, and then you can continue after that. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, how about the quantum number uh, for iron? So let's say, given the quantum number, uh, give the quantum number for iron uh, of the electron removed from iron two plus during its oxidation. So first off, we need to know what oxidation means. Oxidation means we're taking electrons away from the ion or element, okay? So if we take an electron away from iron two plus, it becomes what? Iron three plus, yeah. So if we take a negative charge away from the iron two plus, it oxidizes, it becomes more positively charged, it becomes iron three plus, okay? And now the question is, which electron are we, from this diagram, are we taking away? Because we wanna we want find the quantum number of that specific electron. So which electron are we talking about in this energy diagram? In other words, which electron has the higher energy? Yeah, the negative spin in the 3D, okay. So I've highlighted here, this is the electron we're talking about. It's part of the D orbitals, okay. Uh, in this case, we're, it, we're calling it a negative spin. Um, 
and it's part of the principal number is three because it's part of this three energy level, energy state. Okay, so oil rig, uh, oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. That's yeah, I always use that as well. I say oxidation, uh, reduction is gain and it sticks. Okay, now how about uh, L, the, the orbital mo uh, angular uh, momentum quantum number? Remember, L corresponds to like S, P, D, and F. So we say three, we say two. Okay, so two is correct because remember, uh, L is always gonna be, it can be any number from zero to one minus N. Okay, so it can't be three. And if we look at uh, principle number three, the orbitals that are allowed to be in principle number three are s orbitals, p orbitals, and d orbitals. So that would correspond to zero, one, and two. So in this case, L would be two because we're talking about the d orbitals. If we're just talking about this one electron, two. Now what about the, this is the magnetic quantum number. And, uh, Okay, so this one's a bit arbitrary because we, we, we don't know which orbital this corresponds to. Uh, the magnetic number will correspond to these different symmetries, these different suborbitals, right, of the D uh, orbitals, okay? And remember, the numbers available for the magnetic quantum number are uh, negative, negative L, so it could be negative two, all the way, integer values all the way to positive L, or positive two. So just arbitrarily, we're gonna say it's this first one, this first symmetry, which would be negative two. Okay, so that represents this symmetry. You, you don't need for, you know, whatever exam, you don't need to know these symmetries, but you do need to know, you know, you can assign these numbers. Okay. And then how about the magnetic spin quantum number? Yeah. So again, this is a bit arbitrary, but since, since our arrow is pointing down, I like to give it a negative one half. Okay. So you should, that's what you should uh, know what to do is find the, the, the electron configuration of different atoms. I, I think, it, you know, like I said, it gets a little bit co more complicated. And as we saw uh, for the transition metals, but you, before the transition metals, you should know, it should be pretty clear how to come up with these numbers and then also the finding the quantum number of an electron. Okay, so you sh that's what you should know. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about bonding. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip over this a little bit. Um, it, you don't need to necessarily know uh, this part, but I think later in this course, you will be talking about band theory or ele these electron energy bands. And these, what's, what's important about these energy bands and how different elements, uh, and this is, we're talking about a bulk material now. We went from a single atom and now we're talking about a bulk material and the electron energies of a bulk material. And they fill up what we call bands. And the bands are important because it will tell you what type of material you're dealing with, electronically that speaking. So whether it's, a, a, I have some examples here. Well, we have magnesium, Silicon, here's an example of SP hybridization. So here we, in silicon and other like uh, covalent materials like carbon, uh, they'll, the S orbitals and P orbitals will combine to make an SP hybrid. So for example, graphene, remember carbon is bonded to three different other carbons, that'd be SP2 hybridization. Uh, carbon and diamond or silicon is uh, the diamond crystal structure has sp3 hybridization and then they can also so on this is called uh, molecular orbital theory but you don't need to know that for this class but eventually i think when we start talking about electronic properties you will need to know a bit about the the band structure and so like i said the different band structures can tell you information on its electronic properties whether it's an unfilled band or it has a band overlap those are different Conductors like metals will have that type of band structure. Insulators and semiconductors have what's called a band gap. And then this is very important for uh, different semiconductive devices like uh, um, solar cells, for example. Solar cells, the, the voltage uh, that generated by a solar cell is related to the band gap. Or for example, the LED, if you have an L a light emitting diode, the color 
of the wavelength of the light or the color of the light uh, corresponds to the band gap of that material. Okay. Anyways, so, but we'll, we will talk a bit about bonding uh, today. So there's a different type of bonding, covalent bonding, as you, you probably know, this is a pretty standard stuff um, you should already know. Covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons between atoms. Ionic bonding is the stealing or giving of electrons uh, between different atoms. So we get what we call ions. So a lot of uh, ceramic materials are made out of these uh, ionic bonded materials. Uh, covalently and ionic bonded materials are typically uh, insulators or semiconducting materials. And then metallic bonding, uh, so you'll have electrons that are, that are part of bonding that, and then you have electrons that are part of conduction. And we call that the valence electrons, C of valence electrons. Um, okay. And of course, uh, a lot of the conduction and like thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity are, are functions of temperature. Right? As we increase the temperature, that can change the conductivities. It can change the number of electrons in the sea of electrons, or it can change the number of electrons that maybe are not part of bonding in covalent materials like silicon. Uh, and so temperature has a big effect on those properties as well. So, you know, it, it's easy to, to make this diagram and, and kind of categorize materials as being either covalent or ionic. But in reality, there's very few materials that are purely covalent or purely ionic. And in reality, there, there's a bit of mixed character uh, if, you, if you combine different elements in the molecules. There's a bit of mixed character, and we call that the percent ionic character. Um, so for example, like some, some I, I guess you could consider silicon like, uh, and carbon, diamond, as purely covalent, all right? But, um, other, you know, in general, if you mix a, a metal or transition metal with a non-metal, then you get a, a, a ionic compound. So some examples are like lithium oxide, titanium oxide, iron oxide, aluminum oxide, or alumina, sodium chloride, which is very common, uh, salt, uh, table salt. Um, and then covalent compounds are typically uh, more similar compounds. So like the oxygen molecule or nitrogen molecule, or a diamond, um, some, uh, let's think, well, here's some examples. examples. Hydrogen, so hydrogen is one that gets stuck over here as well. Hydrogen fluoride, gallium arsenide, uh, CO2 gas or silicon uh, semi-metal are considered mostly covalent. So, uh, but <clears throat> we can calculate the percent ionic character using this equation. So the next problem is to calculate the percent ionic character of SiO2 where XA is going to be the larger, uh, and excuse me, I for, forgot to mention that this is the electronegativities, all right? Electronegativity is its, you know, its ability or its willingness to accept electrons, right? So we talked about oxygen. Oxygen forms the anion O2 minus to complete its uh, orbital. Uh, and so it's, it's more willing to to receive electrons than give away, where the transition metals and other metals are, are more willing to give away their electrons. So they have lower electronegativities. So XA is always going to be the element with the higher electronegativity. XB will be the element with the lower electronegativity. So from this chart of electronegativities, find silicon and oxygen and calculate the percent ionic character. So I'll give you a, a few seconds for that.
All right, uh, who, who has an answer? Who would like to share an answer for ionic character of silicon oxide? So silicon is a semi-metal, oxygen is a non-metal. So if you think it's uh, probably kind of covalent. Yeah, so we have 51%. Since we square the value, does not matter? Which is, uh, there's, uh, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter, does it? Because if you take the difference, it'll be negative. If it's negative, you square it, it becomes positive. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, 51% is, is what I also got. Yeah, so XA 3.5 for silicon for, or excuse me, for oxygen 3.5 for silicon 1.8, and then 51.4%. Uh, so, you know, it, silicon isn't necessarily, silicon oxide that is, is not necessarily entirely covalently bonded. It also has a bit of ionicity as well. Okay. Um, now let's talk about interatomic distance or essentially the, the distance between um, ions or atoms in a solid. Now for ionic materials, if we consider the material uh, to be a point charge, right? So this one is a positive plus one charge, this is negative minus one charge. Uh, there will be a Coulombic interaction between those ions, right? So you'll have a, an attractive force between them because one's positive, one is negative, and the positive and negative attract to each other. But also remember that there's still an electron cloud of negative charge surrounding the, the ion. This still has that cloud. So if they get too close together, those electron clouds will interact and then that'll create a Coulombic repulsion force. So you have two competing forces. You have an attractive Coulombic force and a repulsive Coulombic force. So we have this diagram here. We're in the blue, we have the attractive force in the, I believe it's green, is the repulsive force. And then the sum of the, of the two is this red line here. All right, and so the question is, you know, what's the equilibrium distance that these ions will, will wanna be at? You know, that's the bonding distance, all right? So that's when the force, the attractive force and the repulsive force is net zero, okay? So there's no, no attraction and no net uh, repulsion. And we can look at it more um, on an energy scale for potential energy, where energy is just the integral of the force uh, versus distance. And so now we have a repulsive energy and an attractive energy, okay? And so uh, again, at the equilibrium distance R naught between the two ions, the potential energy will be at a minimum, okay? The lowest potential energy is where it's more, the most comfortable at, right? <clears throat> so the net energy is the sum of the attractive energy which is uh, the negative of a constant A. And the, these constants depend on you know, the system and uh, perhaps the coordination as well. And then R is the distance uh, that these ions are apart from each other. Uh, so it's the attractive energy and the repulsive potential energy, another constant, and then R to a, a power of N. And typically uh, N is around eight. And I have a problem later on where we can do some calculations. Uh, but first, here's a problem. Uh, just conceptually, if we take a look at these, these different energy wells for uh, energy, potential energy versus atomic spacing of the two different material, uh, atoms, uh, we have some questions we can consider. Uh, so we have two different materials, material A, material B. Material A has a, oops, excuse me, is a bit more steep of a well, and material B is more shallow and spread out. First question is, which material has a higher melting temperature? Okay, so you need to think about what, what is melting temperature mean? And which one of these would be considering having the higher melting temperature? And you can say yes for material A and no for material B if we, if we don't get some answers here. Okay, yeah, so many of you are seeing A, you might have seen the answer that I already had. And, we, and now let's consider why does material A, yeah, the answer is A. Why does material A have a higher, would be have a higher melting temperature than material B? Does anyone wanna uh, speak up or write in chat? Possible. Okay. 
Is it because A can absorb the energy wells deeper so A can take in more energy before it breaks apart? Right, yeah, so it, it's taking more energy before the atomic spacing, and like you said, breaks apart, it breaks its crystal uh, uh, structure. So, so the, melt, the definition of melting temperature is basically, you know, well, of course, it's going from a solid to a liquid, but also, you know, you think of this, we have this crystalline structure where the atoms are arranged in a certain way, um, and then they gain enough energy where that it goes from crystalline to amorphous, uh, like in a liquid. Right, and they lose that they lose that um, coordination with their neighbors. So having a, a steeper well would uh, uh, have a higher melting temperature. Now, how about thermal expansion coefficient? So if you're not familiar with this term, it's basically how much does the material expand when we heat the material up? In general, materials in general materials will uh, expand when they get hotter. So which one of these materials will have the higher thermal expansion coefficient. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are seeing B, maybe, not too sure. If someone has an idea, go ahead and speak up or write in the chat. Why was, would material B, and the answer I have is material B, why would material B have a higher thermal expansion coefficient, or in other words, well, I'll let you guys go, go ahead. Yeah, so we're, we're not, let's say we're not reaching the melting temperature, we're, we're below the melting temperature. We're still a solid and we just increase the temperature. And as we increase the temperature, the solid will, will get a little bit bigger. Why, why might that be? It takes less energy to influence the bonds between the molecules. Okay, yeah, perfect. And we can tell that by the diagram because it's more, it's more spread out. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, if we think of the atoms in a solid, uh, we, it's easy to think of them as frozen in space, but that's not necessarily true. Atoms in solid are, have a lot of energy at room temperature and they're vibrating around, all right? So we see this and it's only at this, this lowest point at zero Kelvin. At zero Kelvin, there's no thermal energy, right? It's the coldest temperature you can be at. At zero Kelvin, you're just going to be at this stuck at this one position. But at room temperature, you're going to have a bit of energy, a bit of thermal energy, right? So you might be higher up on this graph where the you know the atoms can be the 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 atom can be a little bit closer at times to its neighbor or a little bit far, further away at times its neighbor. And if you look at this this dashed line, the dashed line should represent the average between you know the one side and the other side. Okay. Yeah, you, just a quick question about that. Yeah. The graph we're shown is like a probability distribution of the spacing, right? The graph we're showing is like the, the range of the, the spacing energy. possible at an energy yeah, level. Yeah, the graph we're showing is the energy um, it will be the attractive minus the the repulsive energy. Um, yeah, I guess you could think of it as distribution. Yeah, just trying to understand. So let's say like on material B, on a single horizontal line, is that the range of the intertonic spacing at a given energy yes, level? Yes, yes, okay. yes. You can Got think it. of that. Yeah, so as, as we're increasing the temperature, it's going to be more, uh, you know, some more of the atoms are going to be, you know, closer or further apart. But you see that the average is shifting to the right. The average is shifting to higher intertonic spacing. And that's why these materials ex expand in general, they expand as we heat them up. Because on average, they're going to be further away from each other. All right. Where on this more shallow, this uh, steeper curve, the average is not, is not as significant as this one at a, given, at a given temperature. Okay. Yeah, so it just it's important to realize that atoms are they're always constantly moving around. You know, only at absolute zero Kelvin do they, they stay still, right? So at room temperature, they're, they're, they have a bit of energy. Okay, and how about the higher elastic modulus? So uh, if you don't know yet, elastic modulus is essentially the stiffness of a material or, or basically how much force you need to apply on a material to give it a little bit of strain. And we're in the elastic region, which means uh, that there's not gonna be any permanent deformation.
All right, so again, check mark for A and X mark for B. So some, Yeah, so I'll explain the elastic modulus again. Elastic modulus is essentially the stiffness of material. Okay, and that's that's basically, you know, how much force is required to to pull the material apart. But while we're still in the elastic region, all right. For example, like a rubber band, you can you can stretch the rubber band apart, and then if you let go, it returns to its original shape. Uh, there's no permanent deformation. The same thing, if you take a metal, like aluminum bar, and you put a force on it, you're going to be changing the dimension of the material uh, depending on how much force you put on it. Now, for metals that have very high elastic modulus, it's going to take more force to change the, the, the dimension. Uh, and this is before permanent deformation. Yeah, if you put too much force, then you'll, you'll you know, permanently change the shape. And this is not that does not uh, include the elastic region, the elastic modulus. Yeah, higher modulus means it will stretch. Nope, not quite, not quite. A higher, the modulus does not, yeah, the modulus and when it will break, not related. Um, uh, higher modulus means that it takes more force to elastically deform. So elastically means it's not going to break or permanent, it does not permanently deform. Uh, it just takes more force to to strain it a little bit. All right, so it looks like uh, overwhelmingly more people are saying yes for A. Does anyone want to have a ex shout out or explanation of why A would be the material with higher elastic modulus? I think it would be A because on the underneath the slope, this is a bit ahead, I guess, but the area underneath the slope is the energy absorbed. So if you have a deeper well, it would take more energy absorbed before you get into plastic deformations. Yeah, that's, that's a great explanation. I believe that's also uh, in the textbook. It should, should say that as well. Yeah, so we're taking, it takes more energy, right, is the area uh, under the slope to change the atomic spacing a little bit, right? So that's where we want to change the atomic spacing by applying force which is force times distance is energy, right? So the steeper the curve, it takes more energy to change the atomic distance. It will take more force. Yeah, I guess you can also say the, the ad, average slope here is less steep or more steep. It should be more steep. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Um, so here's a problem still dealing with the energy in atomic spacing. Um, and this problem wants you to calculate the equilibrium bonding energy. Now, it's, it's, uh, it, I think we'll go through this together because it's, it's, it's just a, more of a proof than a, a calculation. Um, so as we said, if we're looking at potential energy versus interatomic spacing, we have a repulsive energy and an attractive energy and the sum of the two is the net energy, okay? And of course, the equilibrium distance, R naught, is gonna be at the point of minimum potential energy. So the question is, you know, how can we, uh, here's the question, determine E naught, the equilibrium energy, bonding, essentially bonding energy, determine the bonding energy uh, in terms of A, B, and N. So we, we want to remove R from the equation basically. So the question is, how, how can we go about doing that? And I think the big hint here is that, remember, the equilibrium distance and energy is going to be at the minimum point. So that should be a big hint. And uh, another hint is that we're going to have to use some, some, a little bit of calculus, but not too much. So those two things together, that should, that should light off a, a light in your head when we're talking about minimum and calculus. What do we want to do? We're going to start. We're starting with this equation here. Yeah. So we're going to take the derivative of this equation, and uh, why? Remember, yeah. Set the derivative equal to zero, right? So we're taking the derivative of this curve here, the red curve, and when the 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 curve 
the derivative of the curve is zero, that will be the minimum point. And then we're going to try to solve for r naught at that minimum. So we're going to take this equation, differentiate the equation with respect to r. Okay, so we have a constant, negative constant over r, and a positive constant over r to a, a power of n. All right. Does anyone uh, want to give uh, an answer for the derivative of each of these? So we can start with this, this first term here. What's the derivative of this term with respect to r? So the, the, basically this is one over r, right? That's right. So oop, I gave away the next one, but oh well. Yeah, so the first term is uh, it will become a over r squared. The second one is uh, we take the exponent out, becomes a negative as well. So negative uh, nb and then rn becomes rn plus one. Okay. And then as we said before, we're gonna set the derivative. We're gonna set this derivative equal to zero and that will be the minimum of the energy curve. Okay, and then we can then we can solve for r, and that will be r naught. Okay, so we set equal to zero. We solve for r naught. Okay, and we can separate these terms to get r naught on one side. Okay, and so now we have a value of r naught, which is the equilibrium atomic spacing, and it's a, a given in terms of the constants a, b, and n, which are um, constants that are usually given um, in a problem. Okay, so then what you would do is go back to the original equation, substitute the r for the r naught that we just found, and then that gives you your final equation where you can find the energy, the, the bonding energy, uh, given these constant values, which again, like I said, would, in a problem would be given to you as values. Um, I don't, I, there might be a homework problem uh, similar to this, but I'm not, not sure. I haven't seen the homework yet. Um, but the next one will be, oh, you guys, it's 210. Is it not 210? Is that the end of class? I believe it's 210. Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. So in that case, uh, this, that's, and that's the end of class, right? Um, I will, yeah, I will post uh, these slides online, but there's only a few more, there's only one more problem, basically uh, calculating the, the R naught value um, for lithium chloride, given some constants, uh, so pretty straightforward. Um, I'll post it on Canvas. Also later this week, I think I'll post uh, maybe a survey or something to see what time will work for uh, office hours. Um, also Sid, uh, the other TA will also have office hours, so we'll find a time that works uh, for everyone. And of course, you guys are welcome to email me uh, at any time if you have a question. So go ahead. Uh, quizzes occur on Canvas. Uh, not this week. This week we'll not have a quiz. The first quiz will be Wednesday, next Wednesday. And uh, like I said, I, sh I will send out enough information or maybe a day in advance. So yeah, next quiz and homework will be due Wednesday. Um, and like, Dr. Brush said that should be figured out by tomorrow. All right, have a good weekend, guys.